So this is uh, 2160, uh, the lecture 11, simultaneous localizations and mapping or SLAM. So, so far, you know, we uh, discussed um, uh, common filter, various types, starting with the, the discrete time and then continuous time, uh, moving to extended common filter, um, and then uncentered common filter, um, then the last time uh, we look at the, uh, the base filters, right? So the, today's lecture is a little unique because uh, I, I just want to slow down a little bit and uh, talk about the application side. Uh, now, before going there, um, I just want to uh, uh, point out a few things of which many of you got confused. So um, just a clarification of a linearized common filter. Um, and also extended karma filter. So uh, the din you know, linearized karma filter is to just reduce the you know, nonlinear dynamic systems um, to uh, you know, linearize the, the systems, and then we apply the same, uh, uh, exactly the same, um, you know, algorithms of the karma filter. Um, uh, now the the important point is that uh, um, if you linearize it. Uh, you get the uh, some some linear time buying systems, but a common filter covers that. So you know, taking um, the advantage of that, uh, exploiting that the time buying nature uh, of the systems, even though it is linear, we can actually uh, somehow deal with the nonlinear dynamics, right? So a very important point uh, here is that we linearize it, you know, along a uh, <coughs> nominal the trajectory um, which has been fixed. In other words, it's a prescribed time function, you know, x star t, this is a given and it never changed. So we just uh, take the value from, uh, you know, um, from this nominal trajectory and actually evaluate the Jacobian um, to obtain the, you know, the uh, you know, matrix uh, associated with it. And the rest of the part is exactly the same um, um, common filter. Now, the point is that after you estimate the uh, um, you know, change to the state, you know, that's basically delta x, it's a local coordinate. And to get the global coordinate, you have to add this x star, the nominal trajectory coordinate, so back to uh, this uh, global coordinate. So, right, that's, uh, that's all the other things. So, you know, um, that's how the linear lies the common filter works. Uh, and obviously the weak point is that, you know, this normalized, excuse me, um, the nominal tra trajectory and then actual trajectory may uh, be different. Things are not going as, as, uh, as demanded, as uh, expected. Then actually the error uh, becomes significant and to cope with that difficulty, extended common filter came in and then this one is, you know, in a sense, a totally different uh, algorithms uh, um, than the original common filter. It does not actually uh, um, guarantee the optimality. Um, it is basically nonlinear systems. So, um, you know, we evaluate the, you know, FT and HT at the estimated uh, X star, X hat, excuse me, estimated the X hat instead of a pre times and ascribe the time function x star. And more importantly, I would say that actually state propagation is nonlinear, right? And also um, the predicted the sensor output is also nonlinear function, nonlinear function, full nonlinear function. As a result, the, the estimated the, the new state the two is in the global coordinates. Only the difference is this actually Kalman gain KT, which actually uh, you know, is actually dependent on uh, H, which comes out from this. And then this one is a Jacobian, you know, a linearization. Uh, no, please. And actually PT too. So, um, so this actually uh, uh, change to be made based on the prediction error this gain KT is basically, you know, linearized uh, um, model uh, based. 
So, um, you know, estimated the state XD and the predicted output YD, both are in the original coordinate systems, okay? They're not the deviation from a reference. So that, that's actually a very different, and a difference, big difference from this linearized uh, or original Kalman filter. Okay, um, now uh, this method, um, because um, the uh, gradient is actually the approximation, uh, Jacobian approximation, so sometimes it causes some error. So I'm sending the common filter, it's completely get, you know, it get, get, to read, get, get rid of on the delta or the Jacobian. Instead, we use the samples, right? You know, uh, the sigma points samples. And, and actually samples propagate, that propagation too is a full nonlinear dynamics. Okay, uh, observation, uh, you know, it, um, you know, and the measurement equation too, uh, full nonlinear equation. So we just uh, propagate uh, each sample of points in this way, and then we take the average, which is to uh, get the mean, and then the covariance, uh, and based on the, these distributions. So you know, and then actually a common gain KT two, based on samples. And the PY is actually uh, the innovation matrix, and the PXY is actually uh, you know XY um, you know cross correlation um, matrix, right? So um, again, the um, um, you know estimated the state XT, updated the XT hat two is in, in global coordinate, and then no delta X, and no Jacobian is involved in uncentered comma filter. Now, one weak point of this uncentered common filter is that even though we are, we originally assumed that uh, the noise is actually you know, uh, Gaussian, but it goes through some nonlinear uh, process. Uh, distribution is skewered, you know, sometimes having a multiple modes, uh, multiple peaks like this. But uncentered common filter, we approximate this to a, a Gaussian distribution. So sometimes uh, this one is actually a major gap between the reality and uh, this method, uh, centered common filter. So to uh, improve this, in, in fact, uh, sometimes uh, we have a very clear double peaks that are like this, and actually uh, approximating this to a uh, uh, unipole, unimodal on uh, the Gaussian uh, that leads to a very much you know, different uh, um, uh, you know, erroneous uh, results. So this is a point that we give up. We give up that the estimate is just a single quantity, but instead uh, we accept the multiple, you know, modes like this, or um, we uh, want to estimate the full distribution of the basically, you know, PDF of the, you know, uh, state that we want to uh, estimate. It is called the a belief and the belief is to uh, I know, uh, propagate, and the belief is to be updated based on the new measurements, right? So that's actually um, in the chapman kolmogorov uh, equations, and uh, this one's based on the Bayes rules. Hmm. Now, um, th this was a very powerful tool because we can deal with the non-Gaussian uh, and the non-linear dynamical systems, uh, however, obviously the cost you have to pay is that uh, heavy computation. So you have to compute this, for instance, chapman kolmogorov equations to uh, propagate the belief from uh, gt minus one, xt minus one to gt slash t minus one, X, xt, this is, you know, a priori, um, you know, belief of xt, right? So the, this guy, you know, needing a lot of computation because just to uh, find the um, probability uh, density, um, you know, at the XT, you know, this one is is reached from many points uh, from the previous state. So you have to integrate all this as shown here, right? And then this one must be repeated for every single point along this XT. So if you have, a, if you digitize this, say 1,000 points here, and then 1,000 points here, you have to actually repeat this computation for, you know, the, you know one million points. 
And if you have a state of variables, and this one is, a, you know, you have a 10 dimensional you know, um, state, then uh, you have a 10 million computations needed only for this and every time cycle. So um, it is heavy computation. So um, tomorrow, in fact, we, uh, we're gonna discuss, um, you know, particle filters so that is to uh, compute this one more effectively. So that's the start, you know, story so far. Um, now, what we'd like to do today is uh, to talk about the, uh, one of the major applications in these days, the SLAM, and then how it is used, to, um, you know, on how the common filter is used uh, on, uh, for this, you know, project, uh, for this the type of uh, uh, applications. So, um, you know, self-driving cars are still very uh, popular. Although car industries are now a little bit actually slowing down, um, I mean, maybe only you know um, IT companies can continue the current uh, pace of uh, investment on the self-driving car development. Um, nonetheless, uh, you know uh, it's going to be a huge market, the six trillion dollars market worldwide. So it's a big one. Uh, look at history. It is not 100% clear who did this first, but uh, to my knowledge, in the late 80s, at the Cunningham and Robotics Institute, uh, Chuck Thorpe, uh, Takeo Kanade, those uh, researchers, um, I remember they actually um, putting a lot of box of computers in this band and then moving around the nearby park, uh, um, you know, uh, with that, the, the driver. So that, would be the uh, the first uh, very successful visible uh, the report you know, that I know. Um, the uh, word the SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, was basically um, invented and proposed by Professor uh, Hugh Darren White and uh, uh, John Leonard. At that time, our colleague John Leonard was a student uh, working, uh, supervised by uh, Professor Duran White, and they actually the first uh, um, to, to formulate this one in a very um, uh, solid way, and and then actually build the systems and demonstrate it. So, but that's actually vintage. Uh, this paper is vintage, nineteen ninety-one. So the key uh, concept behind. And the simultaneous localization. Localization uh, basically estimating the position and the orientation of a vehicle. Sometimes uh, people call this a pose of a vehicle, position and orientation of a vehicle in the two dimensional space in particular. Um, and actually, mapping generate and update a map, um, something like this. So they propose that the localization and the mapping have very synergistic kind of effect. So because a more accurate map can localize the robot more accurately, and a more accurate localization can generate a more accurate map. So you know, as robots go around getting more information, a robot can actually better understand the environment and you know, improving the map accuracy. And as the robot has a better, better map, more accurate map, it can locate itself you know, more accurately. So imagine that uh, you go to uh, some, you know, some place, uh, in a, un, you know, unfamiliar building. Um, maybe uh, you go through a hallway, maybe you know, checking the uh, how many uh, you know, little rooms uh, or pillars um, you pass through. And uh, before you, you know, um, enter uh, such a new building, you have some rough uh, image about the uh, environment. Uh, there may be some many uh, rooms are in, in the floor, all right? But as you step in there and then look around, um, you can get the more accurate, uh, you know, um, you know, the map image. Originally, you have no, you know, uh, clue as to the specific dimensions and lengths of the uh, hallway and so forth. But as you walk through it, then you get the much better understanding, right? 
and then maybe a look around that and then um if you want to uh, go to room three three fifty one, and then you can check the uh, you know room number to get there. So, you know this process is very similar to you know the humans um, finding uh, some some uh, place to go. Now it is actually mathematically and methodologically uh, formulated uh, uh, to make that happen. So the key idea is that uh, we like to. Um, include, we like to estimate the uh, some of the landmark or some of peach outs like uh, walls uh, or edges, you know, in the room as parameters uh, to be estimated. And, uh, you, know, you know, if that is actually, uh, you know, static environment, this doesn't change and, you know, a map, you know, the environment doesn't change then we can treat these parameters, the location of the walls and the location of the pillars and some landmarks and so forth. These uh, parameters are basically um, you know, unknown, but a constant, constant unknown. And what comes into mind, you know, if you want to estimate such you know, um, constant unknowns, Mm -hmm. Well, you can recall that uh, you know Kalman filter is very uh, flexible, and there are, there's no fundamental difference between state estimate and the parameter estimate, right? So what you need to do, you can just uh, augment your state space, not only having the uh, robot uh, location x, y, and theta, including the orientation pose x, y, theta. But also some of the uh, parameters involved in a map. Well, we're gonna discuss uh, this a little later. Um, say the location of the walls, if you have uh, some uh, actually knowledge about it, you can actually parameterize the location of the wall uh, with the set, set of parameters, say alpha and R, then you can write the, many of these uh, landmark uh, parameters um, in the state variables. So state variables are extended and the dimensions are much, much higher than the original three, okay? So this is the way how we actually uh, formulate the SLAM. So outline, uh, outline of my um, lecture today, well, I just introduced the SLAM uh, formulation, basic formulation. And uh, the next one, uh, you know, we go about the individual step involved in this vehicle localization based on common filter. Well, in fact, there are so many steps involved and so much and so many variations to the application of a Kalman filter, extended the Kalman filter, uh, unscented the Kalman filter, as well as um, the base filters to this uh, class of program. There are, so many uh, uh, works are being uh, and reported uh, in this field. I started with the uh, just as uh, you know, simple vehicle kinematics problem, um, how uh, displaying the uh, system is a nonlinear and how we model that, and the state equation pro, you know, process noise is formulated. And then we talk about the map representation, very, very simple example, because this is actually a huge area, but I you know we just, you know, uh, save time to look at a very simple case. And also we uh, described some of the range sensor, LIDAR in particular, and the measurement of prediction, and then the matching the data associations, uh, we'll talk about it later, and the state update, okay? And this goes to, uh, you know, segue to uh, tomorrow's uh, lecture, the particle filter, and the more advanced one, the low Blackwell filters and, and many other um, a few tasks. So let's start with the vehicle kinematics. This is uh, some of the materials involved in the other subject uh, I teach, that's a 212, 2120, Introduction to Robotics. Um, so basically these are similar materials. Um, I just pre present, I'm just presenting this in the discrete uh, time format. It's a little bit different, but I mean, basically the objective here is that you know what the sort of a uh, nonlinear dynamics kind of comes in, and how how we quantify 
how we uh, formulate, um, you know, the plant dynamics as well as the, the their um, um, uncertainty, the, uh, the noise model. Okay, so we did it with a simple vehicle, to, you know, just uh, things that you have been, uh, you know, um, playing with. Uh, um, so two wheels, two powered wheels, the right and the left, and as they rotate um, at the same uh, uh, speed, then it goes uh, straight forward. Uh, if the right and left uh, you know, wheels are different velocity, it turns, right? It turns. So the basic, uh, you know, equation, kinematic equation is that, um, well, you know, the average of this wheel, you know, displacement in a shorter time, delta SR and then delta SL, if you take the average, you get the, uh, you know, uh, the line velocity moving forward. At the same time, you have to think about the rotation of the vehicle. Uh, rotation is, kind of, you know, geometrically determined in this way. So we want to actually, and I'll quantify the, this delta theta. Delta theta is this angle, and then that is to say that you know, I just draw the uh, these two lines in parallel. And so the, this distance is delta S R minus delta S L, and the distance between the two wheels uh, tread is denoted the B. So um, you know you can find this angle delta theta from uh, delta SR minus delta SL divided by B. That's actually the um, delta theta uh, rotation of the vehicle. Cool. Okay, now this is a lot of tricky uh, systems. Um, it is called the non holonomic uh, systems and uh, it can't move sideways, right? It can move forward and then rotate, but it can't move sideways. So there's some restriction applies. But I know as far as uh, you want to know x, y coordinates, you can actually find these two equations. So I know delta x change to uh, x coordinate is v is actually uh, this velocity, you know, for the velocity times cosine, you know, theta. Because this is discrete time form, so, um, you know, a little bit better actually uh, discretization is to use this formula, theta plus one of the two, delta theta. If you know uh, the delta theta, delta theta is determined by this, uh, delta SR, delta SL. So using that one, theta is to change, you know, halfway through. So, you know, half of the delta theta is added to this. This may be a better discretization. And that applies to, uh, you know, delta X and delta Y using the sine function in here. Okay. So uh, state equations are viewed from a, a global xy coordinate. I just cut and paste delta x, delta y, and then delta theta over here. So next time step x t plus one, y theta t plus one is the current uh, you know, uh, pose x t, y t, theta t, plus a delta uh, something that we just didn't found in the previous slide. So obviously this one is a nonlinear system. So we apply extended common filter, extended common filter. So when we um, propagate on the next step, we use this equation directly. Now for the purpose of obtaining the common game um, and the covariance, so we need to take the um, um, linear approximation, right? So and taking the, uh, the linear approximation, this is Jacobian. And one tricky thing is that, you know, uh, this guy is basically, uh, you know, um, so the first term is first uh, X component equations, this guy differentiated with the XT. And actually, I'm so sorry, this XT is actually state uh, variable vectorial XT. And then this one is scalar XT, this is bad uh, abuse of notation, but I know, I hope you, you find it actually, you know, uh, clear. So, you know, this is the vector. So first the component on uh, this guy, it divided, uh, differentiated with xt, that's one. And then this one has no yt, so it's zero. And the third one, it uh, differentiated this guy with respect to theta t. Theta t we have in here, so minus vt sine theta t plus uh, one over two, delta theta t. 
Okay, and likewise, you can actually differentiate the D's in three, and then you get the three by three matrix. And interestingly, uh, your input, uh, basically the delta ST, delta, uh, delta SR and L are involved in here. So um, it is actually, uh, you know, included. Uh, um, and to compute that, uh, actually, you know, it is required to include those, you know, input into A. Anyway, so this is actually a key equation to need it uh, for applying the um, extended common filter, okay? Now, um, noise, uh, process noise, how noise comes in, what the sort of noise is, how we can quantify it, okay? So, um, you know, this is one of the methods, you know, uh, not necessarily uh, general, but I know, um, otherwise it's up to us how we really uh, and a model, you know, uh, the uh, model dynamics. So this may be a good example. So we actually look at the individual wheel. So wheel actually moves from here to here. Kinematically, it is supposed to move a certain distance, but in fact, because of slip or some roughness of the, you know, floor, uh, ground, or um, some of the uh, velocity, you know, uh, the, uh, feedback control error, whatever the reason, um, we have uh, some error delta SR and then delta SL. Okay, so um, well, actually, so in, in the errors in here, so error is actually described by you know random noise omega and you know, WR and the WL. So delta SR is actually some an average value plus uh, and a WR. So this noise WR is actually you know mean zero. A mean value is shifted to this one, and this one you know uh, mean zero and mean centered uh, you know noise. So we have uh, you know WTs you know um, right the weed and the left the weed. You know this is our noise source process noise. Now, we had to uh, provide the uh, covariance of this uh, actually noise characteristics. We assume that they're you know, um, um, uncorrelated, but I know uh, the covariance must be um, uh, provided. And this is nothing but an assumption and also people determine this through experiments. It turns out that this, this is a very good uh, an approximation that is, we basically ignore the uh, um, cross uh, terms here. And the diagonal terms, diagonal terms increases in proportion to the distance traveled. The reason why we put the absolute value is actually moving backward, like, you know, variance can't be negative. So actually putting the absolute uh, you know, value in here. So it is actually proportional to the distance to travel. The K, R, K, L actually is something, you know, we need to determine through experiments. Okay, so now got back to this. So, so how this noise is basically influencing the location of XT, YT, and then theta T. Now, this is the, uh, um, um, you know, deterministic part of the dynamics, right? We like to include this guy in here as an additive term. Now, you can see that the, the, this equations, if vt, the theta t, you know, this one is given by this, um, noise free, then this one we can say, um, you know, deterministic. However, because delta SR, delta SL are involved in here, which may be uh, perturbed, um, by WR, WL, uh, shown here. So, you know, we can actually split the VT and the delta theta into the one that that's actually noise-free part and the noise-corrupted term, right? So noise-free term has been taken care of uh, by the discrete, uh, you know, uh, the deterministic uh, state uh, transition, okay? So what we need to do is to find the effect of, um, you know, delta SR, delta SL perturbed this much, WR and the WL. So let's see, we, what we need to do is basically, I know we need to find the, this, you know, GT, 
Um, so um, again, we differentiate this with respect to delta theta and a delta, delta SR and then delta SL, right? So yeah, you know, uh, this one is the three dimensional vector and then this one, the two dimensional vector and the resultant matrix is three by two matrix. The first element is actually differentiated this term with respect to, you know, SR, okay, SR, right? And, you know, SR, you know, does include the, the WR, so and that's the reason. So differentiated this with the SR, you know, just not relevant. The BT, behind the BT, there's actually SR. So first, uh, you know, differentiate this, and you know, all this one is to just you know, follow. And then BT is differentiated by delta SR, is to give you just, you know, one over, one over two. So this is first term. And then now, now this one is to be also, you know, differentiated with respect to, you know, a chain rule. First uh, differentiated with the theta T, and the theta t does include that you know delta s r and the delta s r story. So excuse me, uh, no, not this theta r. It's, you know the, this guy, this the delta theta t. Excuse me, delta theta t includes the delta s r. So differentiate it, and it comes out the minus sign the, this this one, and differentiate this guy with respect to uh, delta s r gives actually you know two b. And then the delta S actually, you know, delta S over two and coming from this is actually used here. So the, this equation, this matrix is represented uh, with respect to, you know, the delta uh, SR, the delta SL, um, and, and actually delta S is actually the function of those. So the, this is actually GT. So we now have, uh, you know, the two major components. Um, and AT has been obtained, and then GT has been obtained. And then the Delta S original, I know, um, original, I know, error, you know, you know, in the uh, right wheel and then the left wheel, this is the original covariance, right? So process actually noise comes in. So putting here the sandwiched uh, with the GT from both sides. Uh, it turns out um, this is the PTT plus one slash T as a vehicle travels, I know, a certain distance. Then actually uh, this one comes out and then basically it grows. As you travel further, this, you know, error covariance is getting larger and larger. Um, of course, that would make sense, right? Um, you know, basic... Uh, uh, covariance of the noise source is proportional to the distance traveled. So because of that, this grows in the farther and farther. And also interesting uh, to see is that the uh, um, you know, sideway error is basically larger than the uh, this actual longitudinal you know, directions. And that's also that makes sense because you know sideway this actually one. Uh, if the um, you know angle um, you know is a little bit you know um, um, more erroneous times the distance of travel you know this uh, sideway deviation it gets larger so the, this distribution reflects that but now vehicle is actually a little bit you know moving along the circular trajectory you know the um, process noise uh, covariance actually result in the larger um, you know, PT plus one T um, a priori uh, error covariance, right? As, as shown here, as the vehicle travels in this way, it shows a very uh, kind of unique uh, skewed, um, yeah, uh, error distribution. So having this one in mind, the uh, vehicle, you know, dynamics, if you quantify the noise dynamics, it's quite interesting and very unique. And these are all incorporated into Kalman filter. Next, let's actually represent the, the map of the environment. And what we do here is the simplest one. We just consider only the line representation, walls and the furniture, etc. It creates some lines, right? So taken uh, the lines from here, we have uh, this kind of you know, um, representation of the environment. 
uh, by using you know, lines. So we uh, described each you know, line segment and you know, locations and, and actually distance, uh, so forth. And uh, you know, we, we use this as the uh, um, you know, um, map representation. Now, um, the state of the art in you know, 3D map building um, with the locally tunable you know, resolution based on the point cloud data obtained from a 3D scanner, 3D LIDARs or depth cameras. It's actually, you know, this, this area of research is a technology development going very, you know, quickly further. But I, we just, you know, um, use the simplest one, just a 2D. And actually, you know, this area has a lot of image processing is involved in the comma. And an interesting comma filter is locally used for image processing, in, in, in particular, integrating RGB or RGB depth camera with the uh, lighter on uh, information. Um, you have multiple cameras and you want to estimate the location of wall, for instance, you know, you need to use some framework for sensor fusion and the common filter is used for that purpose too. Now, uh, I, I, I released the last week, the, um, um, you know, context oriented uh, project uh, number two and in that, uh, um, we uh, introduced the, uh, the LIDAR. It's light detection and ranging sensor. And then it uses the um, in a laser. Um, laser light is basically, um, uh, you know, scanned this way and then you know, uh, impinge the uh, laser dot is detected. The thereby we can detect the both uh, you know um, the locations and you know distance um, of the target to point. Um, by structure, neither uses the polar coordinate. Um, you know the you know laser beam is scanned in this direction, and actually you know measure the distance when first uh, that light uh, is intersects or impinged on the object, right? So th that is actually the information we get uh, from this sensor. So the sensor uh, naturally is nonlinear um, in that. Okay, so uh, using uh, this actually, um, you know, LIDAR information in polar coordinates, how can we actually detect the uh, wall and uh, uh, find some parameters involved? First of all, uh, wall is described in polar coordinates. And all I would say that, you know, just to use the, uh, the this representation. Um, so it's supposed to be the straight line that's sitting here. And uh, what we'd like to uh, describe this line is in terms of the distance from here to this in the wall. And it's a direction or orientation in alpha, um, this, uh, is you know uh, the you know measured from the sum x you know, coordinates and indicate the the directions of unit unit vector cosine phi and the sine phi. So if you pick any line any coordinates x y from this line, and if you take the you know uh, inner product between that coordinate x y and this unit vector here, uh, that gives the projection the length this r. So, you know, uh, taking the uh, inner product x, y, and the cosine alpha, sine alpha, you get the r. Or expanding this at x cosine alpha plus y sine alpha equal r, right? So if a LIDAR detects a point on the line, say that that's a point, you know, also, you know, the LIDAR information is basically in you know, a polar coordinate. So at the distance low, um, and then it, on orientation the theta, you find the, some dot over here. So if this one, um, if this spot is on the um, the straight line, uh, it has to satisfy this the conditions, right? Um, you know, either way, you can uh, substitute the uh, x is actually low, you know, cosine theta, um, and then low sine theta, that's x, y coordinates you know, of, of this point. This one, you know, substitute into this, 
and the Monsanto equation, you get the, uh, you know, the, the equations. Or, or most simply, uh, you have a theta and the alpha. So this, this you know, difference is theta minus alpha. So if you take a cosine of uh, you know, rho, uh, cosine of theta minus alpha, multiplied to a rho, that is actually this distance, right? So that's actually the this equation, rho cosine theta minus alpha equal r. Now you suppose you have a total capital and um, I know data points, you know cloud uh, point to cloud in here, and I equal one to n, and all and rho i theta i is uh, actually indexed with uh, this you know i. Then what you'd like to do is to uh, draw the least square you know straight line, right curves, right. So the distance between any point uh, detected and this line is basically given by this, right? Given by this, you know, this equation is the case when the distance is zero. Away from it, you get the, the this expression. So di is actually squared, and then we take the um, an argument the minimum of this guy with respect to alpha and the, you know, r, alpha and r, to find the best fit of the straight line represented uh, with the alpha and the r that is to best fit the uh, these sample points point clouds okay now you know one more twist in here is that uh, since the data points are coming from that uh, lidar right as i said the lidar um i know accuracy uh, is pretty good um if that's actually a shorter distance from here but as it goes farther, it is actually you know, more inaccurate, inaccurate. So why not actually take into account the, the accuracy or, or variance of the you know, individual you know, and points detected? So um, let's see the distance is related to the variance. So, you know, um, we, um, you know, weighted the, each penalty um, squared error from the straight line, the di square, weighted by one over sigma square. And you know, a large sigma means that the you know, unreliable data that is actually taken, um, you know, scaled down. And if the sigma is small, actually shorter distance like this point, you know, has a more credit, so, you know, larger weight. Now, let me just remind you that this is, this actually um, uh, ellipse indicate the um, kind of, you know, uh, two-dimensional, you know, covariance, and that, that is a, actually uh, sensor signal covariance, right? Now, uh, you know, unlike the uh, process noise, that's actually, a, you know, um, sideway, uh, error is larger, and then actually longitudinal error is uh, you know smaller. The sensor uh, covariance is opposite, right? So so remember, I just showed this one a bit some time ago. Longitudinal direction is a small, and the sideways is a large. But I know in here is the opposite, right? So um, but anyway, so distance is a very critical factor um, to evaluate it, to quantify the accuracy of the measurement. So let's take into account this. Okay, now, um, well, as you repeat the, uh, this curve fitting for different set of data, sometimes you get the straight line and best fitted this way, or sometimes uh, it is actually orange line here, sometimes red line. So you may see uh, some kind of variance about this, right? So now we can uh, conceive the uh, error covariance of the parameter alpha and the r, as you repeat this many times, you get the uh, many set of straight lines, parameter lines with the alpha and the r, you can actually um, quantify that uh, error covariance with this matrix in r. So alpha and sigma, you know, alpha alpha, sigma alpha r, sigma alpha r, sigma r r. Okay, so, um, you know, sigma alpha r is basically uh, the variance of, uh, you know, alpha parameter, and the sigma r r is actually um, the uh, uh, r parameters. 
So this is a little, actually very much, we cooked the original signals and we end up with the you know, alpha and the R. The, the things we are doing is basically, um, we, in many ways, uh, we uh, process the original the signals um, and relate that one to the world we like to uh, detect. So in a sense, we can think about the, suppose you have a special sensor that is to detect the you know, world. So that sensor's output is alpha and R, not the original, you know, um, you know the LIDAR signals, but I know this special virtual sensor, I would say virtual sensor, can actually produce alpha and R. And then for that sensor, we quantify the uh, error covariance in this way. So please think about them that way, okay? So we have a special sensor that produce the R and alpha, the, the line and the segment. Okay, so where we are now, so we all talk about the, uh, this measurement side because the measurement is actually not just a simple one point measurement, but I know we collect the measure, many measurements from the you know, LiDAR and RGB cameras and so forth. So, so, um, and then that is uh, um, you know, converted to um, kind of you know, landmark or some marker in the, in, in, in the, in the environment uh, involved in the map. So that's actually a story about the you white know, T. Now this, you know, white T must be compared to white T hat. What is white T hat? White T hat is something that uh, you should be able to predict based on the current uh, a priori state. Then from that position, you should be able to get the uh, this signals, this sensor signals, and that the signals is built upon your model and your current uh, you know, um, estimate of location, then that is to be compared uh, to this YT. And the physical sense of YT now is basically the, uh, the wall uh, parameters, alpha direction of the wall, and the distance R. Okay, so these two are to be compared. You know, uh, compared. So in doing so, first we had to create the YT hat white hat based on the XTT minus one hat. So how we did it do that? So the point is that uh, this is a measurement prediction. Suppose uh, you are origin, you know, the previously XT minus one, this position, and then uh, you do some uh, actually, uh, you know, um, propagation of the state from this point to this point. So this one, XTT minus one. You supposed to be this point. Now, if you are you know, at this point, what the sort of uh, parameters of each wall are you supposed to receive? Well, here, you know, say, that, you know, uh, detecting this wall, this wall, you should be able to uh, see the wall in this direction, out of R, and then at this distance, uh, R, right? That is something that you expect to receive from your in a world detection sensor, alpha R. Yeah, so, so we need to create this, okay? Alpha hat and then R hat. There are many uh, that pass uh, multiple worlds. So in this case, uh, we just uh, put the, you know, upper script uh, J to uh, describe this is the J's wall. Okay, J's wall. So the thing is, uh, is like, just like this. Suppose you are here, okay? including your orientation. So now your local coordinates are pointing in this direction. Okay, you know, you are here. From this coordinate, you should be, you know, see, a, a, able to see the award in this direction. So that is this guy, you know, from that position, you see this wall, you know, at the, at the distance uh, R, and then, you know, um, you know, the orientation out of R. What is involved in this the computation is nothing but the coordinate transformation. You know, based on the disposition and the orientation, then you look at this, okay? Just a, you know, coordinate transformation. So now with that, uh, we started with the point to clouds and identify the lines, okay? But maybe you detect the, you know, many lines. These are all possible line segments uh, here and there. 
And if you plot those lines in the uh, R and the alpha parameter space, you have a uh, you know, candidate to point to here and a point to here and a point to here. Maybe four or five uh, lines are described in here with the different uh, you know, variance, covariance, right? Just as we quantified it. You remember that we did quantify um, the, uh, the variance in terms of parameter R and the alpha, right? So this is you know important information how reliable they are. Okay, the next next thing is that uh, you know so uh, you know if you have multiple walls, you need to distinguish which which you know which one is which. So that that's actually uh, the next two things. It's called the data association, data association. So at the time you know t minus one, you had uh, some estimate here, and then you had the estimate here and here. Now you have uh, at the time of the T, uh, you get the, uh, um, you know, uh, your predicted one here and here and here, here, right? So, you know, um, these are basically walls, sometimes visible, sometimes because of the occlusions, you can't see it, you know, here one wall is away from it, so there's no correspondence to that. So among the many possible, you know, uh, the walls, um, you have to make the right matching between the actually you know, observed one and then predicted one. Um, th th these are very distinct, so easy to distinguish, but I know these distances uh, you know, uh, getting closer, it is a little bit tricky. So you have to use the right tools. And uh, actually, again, we like to take into account the reliability of each measurement uh, quantified by this, um, you know, uh, ellipse uh, coming from the uh, error covariance. We actually um, and weight uh, the, the difference by means of the error covariance. And such uh, the distance is called Mahalanovis distance. And actually vectors basically, you know, this is like the quadratic form, is basically, you know, um, quantif uh, weighted the distance is weighted by the inverse of the uh, error covariance. The little computing thing is actually the, um, the, the reference I look at is actually they are using the row vectors. So <laughs> I just put the transpose here. And so this looks like a, a wrong notation, but in fact not because this guy is a row vector. So this represents a, a quadratic form and it's a scalar quantity. So that scale quantity is, you know, uh, smaller than the certain values that we can say that the, uh, the this i uh, measured uh, in the parameters and the predicted the, the j uh, um, parameters are basically the right match. So we can compare the uh, predictions prediction against this actual measurement for that pair. Remember, we have many, you know, you know, uh, walls. So we have many, you know, um, pairs of um, measured and predicted ones. So to sound, we have many sensors, right? Again, our sensor is to a very special virtual sensor producing alpha and R. And, uh, you know, this is the uh, you know, covariance we use. So with that, uh, we can finally update our state. You know, previous state is here, somewhere here, and then actually move to xt t minus one. You know, this point, and you know, with 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 that, we have uh, uh, an prediction error, error covariance uh, pt t minus one. So putting these together, uh, we can actually find the uh, Kalman gain. You know, from this expression, and the Kalman gain uh, can be obtained. Uh, um, you know, innovation matrix, and then actually, um, you know, the PY is the innovation matrix, and then the H and the P. Um, and then actually, this is actually meaningful comparison. You have to make the comparison uh, between matched, you know, pairs of walls, right? So with that, uh, you can make a, com you know, a correction to um, the current state and, uh, you know, landmarks. Okay, so you know maybe this guy is actually uh, you know um, extended the Kalman filter, although 
uh, you know, you know, many of them, uh, the, the basic uh, dynamic equations is governed by this. So, you know, instead of using this, we use this, you know, original, you know, full nonlinear equations. And this, this y is actually given by this. This is actually long list because we have so many walls in here. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, this is the way that uh, we use, use the updating the filter, um, updating the gains. Okay, so just to summarize this slum, um, again, the localization of mapping, synergistic effect uh, in estimating these, uh, you know, simultaneously. So the basic techniques is uh, augment the state variables by including the feature parameters. You know, uh, in this derivation, we use the line parameters, alpha and R, in addition to original main um, state to estimate X, Y, theta poles, and we have uh, many uh, pairs of them, okay? And you know, um, we uh, predict the uh, expected uh, um, world parameters, alpha and J, based on the previous one, and then actually this one is to be compared to the right the matched um, actual measurement. So, you know, we cycle through that process um, to, uh, you know, update both, you know, current position and the parameters involved in the uh, systems. Yeah, um, so comma filter based SLAM, um, generally very fast to compute. And we assume uh, the Gaussian noise, um, but, but in reality, measurement noise and the process noise are non-Gaussian, you know, um, some tricky cases. Um, so uh, nonlinear dynamics, so we just use the extended common filter, okay? But I, extended common filter is limited in dealing with the rapidly changing nonlinearity. So as you know, that is actually a little bit in trouble. So, um, I know uh, many people use the uncentered common filter instead, uh, facing uh, some uh, sharp nonlinearity, and uh, that's the way to go. And also, you know, in some cases, uh, the computation of uh, Jacobian is not that uh, simple. So that's actually, you know, uh, UKF is to get rid of that kind of, you know, uh, stuff. Now, I have to say that the SLAM is limited to rather slowly changing environment. We assume that the parameters and the landmarks, the world locations are basically stationary, right? But in fact, uh, you know, uh, think about the busy uh, environment. Uh, even the factory floor, many things are brought in, and many things are brought out, and uh, the map changes, right? So if the vehicle is to uh, locate itself based on the, those uh, um, you know, landmarks, but the landmarks change it. So sometimes uh, it is to arrive at the wrong, uh, wrong uh, reasoning, wrong estimate. So this basic uh, concept behind the slum is that uh, at least the environment uh, is changing much more slowly than that actually robot is to find its locations um, in there. So that's actually some, uh, one of the uh, you know, important uh, open questions that people are now working on that uh, kind of stuff, um, how you deal, deal with the rapidly changing stuff. Also SLAM is limited, you know, um, parameter representation 3D environment uh, is often a challenge and then that's actually uh, sometimes people are uh, you know, having uh, troubles. Let me just show you a few um, videos and then uh, entertain the questions, I suppose. Um, so uh, the, this is uh, this video is uh, rather old. Um, the um, uh, this is basically the company I established, to, you know, working on this kind of stuff. Uh, um, this is a vehicle looking around um, the map. Uh, you know, moving around this environment and augmenting the map 
right? So as it uh, visits the many corners, it, it actually gained more you know, information. And you know, the map is more actually you know, augmented and uh, you know, details have been uh, added to, to the map. So it, it's to show the process how it can actually you know, augment and then you know, improve the uh, you know, map you know, you know, details. Okay, so the map is revised and it becomes more accurate as the robot moves around and the more images are obtained. Okay, now, so once you have some, uh, you know, even though the map is not complete, you can still actually go around, um, you know, purposely if you specify the, uh, you know, certain uh, destination to, to go, um, the robot can go. On the way, it finds more you know, environment information and actually it can arrive at the um, uh, destination. So in this actual video, robot is here and then it indicates a little difficult to see this uh, green light or white line, the green light is actually the point, uh, pointing the destination. So we'll see how it works. So initially a robot is actually facing this direction and it'll move around. Um, yeah, sniffing around a little bit and I have to uh, detect a bit more information. Um, and you know, um, trajectory has been set and actually it goes. Yeah, so as it goes, the more information and actually it can go in you know, even a narrow corner and then I arrive at the destination. So, um, and then now, uh, it points uh, um, another destination here in a green light. So actually, you know, points the, um, yeah, and then immediately trajectory is planned and execute the uh, task. So robot actually detecting the whole environment um, and go around and yeah, even go through a narrow doorway. Um, when it's uh, not sure, it goes slowly, yeah. And here's the doorway and going to the hallway like that. So I think that's good enough. So that's, that's the, uh, you know, the technology. So um, maybe I should stop uh, my talk here and entertain some questions and then let's discuss the project number two a little bit. So I have one question. You guys are a little bit you know, quiet today. Oh, yeah, I know, um, long form notes. Yeah, I know for this particular lecture, I have uh, two or three lectures having no written, uh, you know, complete notes. Yeah, the, this one is more or less uh, just applications. And so um, I did not prepare for it, um, but I think it's a clear just the following day. So you can actually work on the you know, project number two and so forth. So. so Unfortunately, I don't have it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, any questions? Uh, well, I know a little bit the smaller gathering today. <laughs> it's kind of, I know, uh, irregular schedules. So, I don't see many students today, but I know uh, if you have any uh, questions, I know, uh, please just speak directly. Okay, uh, very, very quiet. Uh, let, let me see. Uh, no, I posted the uh, the slides, uh, uh, so um, maybe you can check it. You know, some of the details, but uh, that's all about the uh, you know today's uh, you know contents. So back to this. Um, yeah, project number two um, uh, is actually uh, it's to be discussed this Friday and the you know do the following monday right so it has a two questions and i know first question yeah first question is pedestrian trucking so this is not actually navigation okay um but uh you know one key component uh, i know maybe i should uh, talk about this scenario the robot uh, actually you know need to be deployed to so a busy environment like this, a train stations or you know, airport, right? 
So, you know, the robot has to move around um, safely. And also, um, you know, it has to, it should not actually impede the flow of the people, right? So, you know, um, you have to really find, uh, you know, what way that is least interfering or with the people and then actually uh, should not be a burden, should not be an you know, um, obstacle for other people. So moving uh, this at the, con at the same speed uh, as other people, that's the best, right? And then it, it should be able to walk and it should be able to move in the same way as other average pedestrian. So then that's actually the important you know, um, you know, you know, functional requirement uh, for this vehicle. Now, the first thing is that how you, uh, you know, detect the people you know, surrounding you. And this is not only just a snapshot measurement, you, know, you identify uh, the location of those people, but also you have to estimate and predict the course and the speed of individual pedestrians, right? So if you see uh, that this person moving from here to here, you know, you keep an eye on this and, uh, because it might uh, collide with the, the, this pedestrian. So, you know, uh, keep track of it and uh, you, you can establish a common filter to each of the pedestrian and, and actually estimate the, their locations, the next location, the future locations, and then their velocities. Based on that, uh, you can actually, um, you know, design and actually find, create the trajectory to follow, right? It has to avoid the, you know, collisions, obstacle, um, you know, collision. And it should be able to uh, going towards your destinations, right? Uh, first thing is that you have to know these moving targets, where they are moving, and then how they go at a certain time later. So that, that's actually the first uh, in the questions and uh, part one of this project. So and a lot of the data actually has been uh, applied. Uh, you can download the, the LIDAR data. Um, uh, so, so we use the LIDAR data. So um, it is a polar coordinates, right? So that's the first challenge you have to uh, take polar coordinates, right? Um, yeah, you know, um, yeah, you know, uh, we want you to, uh, you know, implement the extended common filter and then uncentered common filter for, you know, predicting the uh, single passenger, um, you know, trajectory, okay? Now, we have a little bit more complicated situations, you know, because multiple, you know, passengers are moving around, right, moving around. And then one the very tricky part, maybe I can see it in here. Uh, it's not too clear. But you know, if you are sitting here and look at, uh, maybe you can see the, these people, but uh, you can't see the you know, person behind it, right? Or sometimes uh, actually, uh, you know, some persons are walking uh, you know, oblique directions. And you know, at a certain point, a um, person a little bit behind the, you know, that, you know, and the, and the, the walker is not visible, occluded. So that kind of thing happens. So uh, this question C, if you actually download the, the data, you have uh, two passengers detected by this LIDAR. However, the challenge is that uh, um, at certain time period, the person behind uh, one person is not visible. So how do you really deal with this kind of situations, right? You, you know, suppose you are actually walking, um, yeah, um, well, along the infinite uh, uh, corridor, it's a little bit of a challenge to me, but I know that sometimes the students are walking up together and then, you know, occlusion happens, right? And uh, you know, occasionally we see Abrupt, uh, abruptly, some uh, some some pedestrian shows up because it's being occluded, and suddenly it becomes invisible. But uh, you know, otherwise, you know, when you actually you know um, look at the multiple persons, and you know, someone uh, became invisible. However, you know that the previously that person walking in certain direction at a certain speed. 
So you can predict, you know, after a certain time, it, he or she should have shown up at this point, you know, at a certain velocity, right? Of course, uh, this one is based on the previous uh, estimate and then no new information is basically obtained, right? So what you do, you can basically, you know, simulate, you know, you know, you know, on, um, open loop uh, simulations for multiple time steps, right? While actually the person on that position, position is not visible, you can't affect the new data is assimilated and update your location, but instead you have to keep going your simulators, simulations, right? So this requires a little bit of thinking as to how to deal with such situation. And also interesting is that, uh, you know, I know, imagine, and let me just, take, you know, uh, change my face. So um, imagine that the certain times that you don't have much data, right? Um, you can not only, um, um, you can, you are unable to update your estimated location of the passenger, but also you cannot uh, update your covariance matrix too, right? You know, uh, the covariance is actually, uh, you know, um, uh, getting worse and worse uh, because I you know repeated the use of um, propagation, you know, making the, you know, um, a priori um, inner covariance uh, larger and larger, right? So this is uh, one scenario that uh, extended common filters, you know, cannot actually uh, capture that well, right? So, um, uncentered common filter too, it's a challenge, but I know uh, we'll see what's gonna happen. So that, that's actually something you should keep in mind. Uh, okay, um, so, you know, uh, both the cases, uh, uh, actually this second case in particular, you know, it is, in the worst comes to worst, you know, it tends to diverge, diverge. Yeah, um, the linearization, and based on the Jacobian, they used for extended karma filter in particular, may be more vulnerable, you know, in such situations. Okay. Um, the second part is the localization. So the robot is in a room. Actually, uh, I tried to use a more realistic room, but I know just to make your effort, uh, you know, um, simple. I just use a very uh, in a simple room, and uh, we have uh, you know totally six walls here and here, and the robot is moving around and then actually um, you know you know locating uh, itself more accurately as it goes. So this part is very much following the today's lecture, starting with the. Uh, um, Uncertain uncertainty quantifications with respect to the weed slip. So you know, as um, you know, vehicle travels for a longer distance, um, the uh, error covariance are getting larger, right? So in terms of the delta S R, delta S L, and here, you know, it is to be more, you know, on the error covariance. Uh, in proportion to the uh, distance travel, we use this model. Okay, so starting with the initial conditions, which is also given in the downloaded, uh, you you download the data. It indicates the initial conditions of so forth. So obtain the predicted output measurement for the initial step. So what, what's that? You know, basically, um, you have. Uh, um, you know, you start with the original map information, right? Which may be incorrect. And then you have an initial estimate of your position that's propagated to this position, X10. So you just ask yourself, suppose uh, the robot is here, robot is here, and then look at the, uh, so each wall, where the, you know, wall is to be located. So viewed from this actually particular local coordinate and the you know, polar coordinate is defined 
you know, to this vehicle. Oh yeah, this one is a simplified problem a little bit, you know. So we use the, uh, you know, uh, global coordinate X and uh, theta is measured from that point. So measured from uh, this line, what is the location of uh, this guy? And also in terms of the alpha and, and the distance r, okay. So you know if you know the uh, estimated uh, the position, so you can actually create the alpha and the r, right? And then this one is to be compared to the actual measurement, okay? Now you, you know measurement side uh, we can uh, it's a little bit involved, right? Uh, first, the data you download into the LiDAR data. It's basically a collection of points all around this point, all around this point. So first, the task is segmentation. Segment like the data into the individual walls by hand. So I um, um, there, there's uh, some uh, nice tools to apply to do automatic segmentation. But you know, you know, uh, for this in this case, let's do it by hand. So if you look at the data, you can easily find the, uh, you know, you know, there's some discrete change in the data num number 55 to 59 that you have some of the change in the, you know, kind of location. So, so first, uh, you know, point one to uh, point 50, you know, the nine, uh, you know, that's actually representing this wall, wall number one, and the next one, wall number two. So, you know, um, I ask you to do it by hand, just to simplify the problem, okay? But the main part is this, the estimate, and then estimate the world, you know, feature parameters alpha and r from that actually set of, uh, you know, point to clouds, okay? Obtain the initial measurement, uh, you know, y and one uh, i, this is basically, you know, um, wall and then pose, right? Yeah. Uh, so we, we create this, and then uh, you know you can actually uh, create the um, you know your predicted uh, output compared to the actual output, and uh, you can actually um, yeah um, yeah uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know update uh, the states. But now in doing so, since we have multiple walls, again we need to do the data associations, and that's a little hard. So, you know, um, the assignment I gave you here is, you know, expect you to do um, this data association on your own manually, manually. By doing this, uh, you really understand what you're really uh, doing and then you know, how this kind of algorithm really works. Okay. And, you know, um, you know obtain the measurement error covariance R1 and then form the Kalman gain the K1. Actually, this is the is standard the, the techniques. And then finally update the state. And I want you to repeat this one, you know, uh, the, twice or three times, a few times, just to get to uh, uh, know how this method really works. Now, some, uh, you know, maybe extra credit, uh, extra credit the job is to, yeah, you know, somehow automate uh, the da you know, data segmentation and the data association that these two parts it can be, you know, um, uh, automated. There are many actually uh, open source uh, softwares is available um, and, and in the community, a Ross community in particular, uh, and many other uh, software, um, and, you know, GitHub too, you know, they have listed the mini software so you can play with this but a key point is that uh, you know uh, as we deal with the image sensors getting the uh, information so yeah we have to do a lot of things yeah and uh, as far as we use the um, you know uh, landmark walls and so forth so we need to relate the original point cloud to those um, in a meaningful you know landmark in some way yeah, so that's that's the thing that you need to do. So uh, this week's of, uh, discussions, you know, I hope uh, the reporter can work on that and to some extent, and then exchange ideas. I do know that the some of them, uh, some of you are in in this field, so uh, you know you can take the lead and uh, actually you know um, share your experience uh, with the other members. Slam beyond the standard Kalman filter. Yeah, yeah, you know, one issue is dealing with the non-Gaussian noise properties. 
and they're dealing with the noise you know, nonlinear process dynamics without the linearizations. So it's basically Bayes' filter is a natural choice. Um, you know, nonlinear dynamics and non-Gaussian noise, we can deal with that. But uh, this one is very heavy in the computation. So tomorrow I talk about the particle filter and the basically Monte Carlo implementation of a Bayes' filter. And uh, even though we use a particle filter, sometimes uh, you know, too much computation is involved. So some uh, clever idea is to you know, combine particle filter with the common filter. So common filter is more actually, I know, uh, streamlined the, the computations, right? You know, um, you know, base filter is to uh, predict the entire, uh, you know, distributions. Common filter, assuming that the Gaussian, the single peak, uh, single mode um, estimation. So the, just the pinpoint the, that the particular and point-wise estimation, everything is more you know, streamlined. Even UKF, we use just a you know, um, small number of uh, uh, sample points, um, and called the sigma points, compared to uh, particle filters, uh, which deal with the thousands of points, uh, they are much more you know, streamlined. So uh, still use of common filter for those actually, you know, um, uh, state variables and and then associated with the, the dynamics of which are more or less linear and actually the you know noise distributions associated with them are more or less actually Gaussian. You don't have to uh, push it to a you know a base filter or a particle filter. You can use uh, the common filter. So combining an, you know uh, Blackwell um, and Rao you know type of a formulation is very effective. Okay. So that's all about it for today. Yep. Okay, so <laughs> um, questions, Alexandro, does the uh, accuracy of the SRAM uh, depends heavily on how well you stored map? Yeah, what if the stored map is not the complete or you move several objects around from the environment? Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, um, well, we have to start with some, um, you know, um, you know, fidelity of the original map information. Otherwise, the first actually a robot, and just as I showed you in the video, um, you know, robot the first doesn't move very much, but are scanned around the uh, you know, environment um, and then getting a little bit more, you know, relevant information before moving. Of course, uh, the, you know, the dilemma is that uh, you can't get the, you know, richer information uh, unless you move around, right? But in order to move around, you have some minimal information. So the threshold, uh, what is actually minimum information needed in the map uh, is something to allow the robot to, you know, move around a little bit, uh, even though that is actually uh, not necessarily going to the destination uh, very effectively. You know, but uh, there's something that the, the robot actually move around safely, uh, and then getting the more information, at least the nearby information that can be obtained. So you know, um, you know, for all kind of uh, um, estimation theory, including this SLAM, we need to, as far as it is actually a recursive method, we need to start with some you know initial conditions. So initial condition is far away from, or, or in, the, in the case of you know, more theoretical analysis, uh, um, you know, it doesn't actually uh, meet the basic requirements of, for instance, the uh, symmetric, uh, you know, positive definite you know, matrix for the initial covariance matrices. That's actually, you know, fundamental requirements, right? So if that kind of requirement is violated, there's no way to, you know, run the recursive computation properly. It's a lot of the different story, but you know, map two, it, you, you have to provide a certain, you know, upper early knowledge. On the other hand, if the map is almost perfect, there's nothing to vary, but you don't have to estimate the parameters involved in map, right? Um, you can concentrate on the localization, even though um, the features you can detect is very, you know, poor, it's not limited, but a map is very much, you know, uh, 
you know, well-defined and a high accuracy one, um, that does help the robot to do more uh, very quickly. Yeah. Now, you know, you know, second question is basically dynamic uh, environment. And you know, this is a little hard. Actually, you know, things have been done already very well to some extent, I would say, is actually um, collision avoidance. If something approaching you and then you set the camera filter for that uh, object and then uh, keep tracking the motion of that. And then, uh, you know, you can predict the future you know, position, the locations, thereby you can find the, uh, some pathway to avoid the, you know, collisions. So that, that has been, that's actually uh, dealing with the more, you know, radically changing the environment, but that's actually very specific uh, collision avoidance. Uh, so that uh, is not that hard. Little hard is that, you know, um, some environment that you have to look at the certain, you know, uh, corners or, you know, landmarks, um, to reach a certain point, but that the landmark is changing. <laughs> Sometimes people move it that way. <laughs> and then that's really happening in a real environment, like a, you know, factory, you know, automations, and that's really needed. And that's still an open question. Yeah, people, you know, still working on that, yeah. And also the LiDAR, uh, the laser doesn't reach, you know, too far. It's about a 20 meters at the maximum. And the further that the point is actually, you know, the, you know, the difficult. And so they use, and they have to use uh, RGB cameras um, that can go a little farther, but not too much depth uh, information. So, yeah, it's still actually you know, a long way to go. Yeah. Okay, but I know I can say that, the, you know, uh, the, the, um, uh, you know, self-driving cars that you have to wait. Uh, I don't recommend you to buy the new, you know, self-driving cars immediately. Um, and uh, that's a hard, but in a more structured environment like a factory, it's already happening. And then that's a drastic change in the happening these days. So this is a real technology. Oops, I, I just overrun a little bit. So I have to close uh, my talk today. So I'll see you tomorrow, uh, one o'clock. Uh, I will work on uh, particle filters. That is to conclude the estimation. Okay, take care. Bye.